If, uh, if you've been with us lately, you probably aren't surprised that's where we're headed. We're in the middle of a series um, in the book of Galatians called Inside Out. And last week we took a little break from that, finished up a, a family series we've been, been um, moving through throughout the year. Um, and uh, now we're back in Galatians. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. We'll turn there um, and we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, before we do that, I just want to say a few things about this passage. Well, first of all, it's kind of a tricky one, okay? And there's, um, Paul just does, does some, uh, he, he, he uses an analogy, lays out this, this argument he's making. It's a little bit complicated. We're just going to work through this tough passage. And my hope is that, um, that you'll get something out of that. Uh, my hope is maybe you'll learn something from it. But even bigger than that, my hope is that through our service, not just through this um, time of listening and teaching, but through, throughout the service and our time of response that you'll have an, have an opportunity to experience God, to encounter him individually, one-on-one, -on -one, and in the midst of this group. So um, that's our hope. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray to that end. Heavenly Father, God, we just ask that today you would um, reveal yourself to us, that as we listen to your word, we would see you more clearly and God, that as we're gathered together, that we would experience you, your heart, and your spirit. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, we have this thing that we do uh, as people where it's, just, it's a normal thing. It's something we do all the time. We are given something, and then we take that thing. It's given to us for a purpose, and we take it, and we sort of twist it and use it for something else. And sometimes when we do that, it can do some damage. Okay? Uh, we're given something for a purpose. We take it, we twist it, use it for something else, really not for that purpose. And in the end, there's some damage from that. So, for example, sixth grade, our teacher comes around to all the tables we're sitting at and gives us a little stack of rubber bands for some project that we're doing at the beginning of sixth grade. And someone in, our, in my, you know, it wasn't me, someone at my table, someone else at the table was like, oh, let's make some zingers. Well, what are zingers? So you take a little piece of paper, fold it up, so it's really hard, you know, put it on that rubber band, shoot it at somebody, it leaves a nice big welt. Um, you, and then, then we get, you know, more creative with it, start incorporating paper clips in there. Now it's really dangerous. You take somebody's eye out with it. You know, we were given these rubber bands for a purpose. We decide, oh, we're going to twist it to do something else with it, and there's some damage. Or uh, it's a Wednesday night, and I'm here, and I need some help moving some tables and chairs, so I give some of our high schoolers, I say, hey, can you take this big cart? and use it to move these tables from here over to there. Sure, yeah, we can do that. Well, of course, next time you come back, there's, you know, three guys on the cart um, and two guys behind it pushing it bobsled style. And eventually there's a hole in the drywall, you know? So you give them something for a purpose, they twist it, and, and um, there's damage done. We do this with, with, uh, with, things, with good things God has given us all the time. It's just sort of humanity's way of, of doing things. God gives us something good like food, you know, uh, to sustain us, to make us strong, to keep us healthy, and we take it and we twist it and we do something else and it causes damage, you know. So we, he gives us food. We, um, instead of just enjoying that food, we take it, we twist it, and so we just eat too much food or we eat the wrong foods and it does damage or really we just we, we go really extreme and we just end up with Pop-Tarts, you know? Um, you know, like we just say, okay, food is good. I mean, just imagine, you know, the, 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 the grain that God has given us, the plants that grow out there, the fruit on the tree or on the ground, and we somehow we take that and we go, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if this just, if, if you could put this in a foil package and it would last for 50 years and you could take it anywhere, you could leave it in the cold, you could leave it in the heat, you could smash it, it would always taste the same, it'd be full of sugar so it tastes good immediately, just, oh, per, that's a Pop-Tart, right? And I love Pop-Tarts, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of taking something God meant for good. And if, you, if all you ate was Pop-Tarts, that's trouble, you know? In fact, probably the more Pop-Tarts you eat, the more trouble your, your, your body's going to be in, probably. So, so we take something good God gave us, and we twist it, and then it causes some damage. Um, we do this with things—we uh, do this with sex. God, God gives us that as, as something to 
that, to build unity, intimacy, connection within a marriage relationship. And instead we take that and we twist it and we make it something that's just about me and satisfying my desires and my needs. And then it causes, instead of, instead of bringing a marriage relationship closer together, it can bring damage to multiple relationships because we take something that's good and we twist it and then there's damage, there's destruction because of it. So there's lots of examples of that. In our culture, we have something good, I think. This sense of American individualism. You know, that I can, uh, I can do things on my own and that when I do things on my own, that's good. Um, this individualism and hard work that's part of our American culture, and that can be a good thing. It leads to a sense of personal responsibility and getting things done, making things happen, hard work, and those are good things. Um, we love to say things like, believe in yourself. You know, and that's usually looked at as a good thing. Believe in yourself. You know, have some confidence in yourself. You can get things done. Um, take initiative. In, in, in America, if you believe in yourself and work hard, we say anything's possible. But we take that good thing and we twist it. And we make what we can do the main thing. We can make what we're trying to achieve the most important thing and it doesn't matter what happens to people around us. Um, and it can be about what I can accomplish on my own and me, me, me. You know, it can become a bad thing. We twist it. It can be somewhat destructive. Well, um, in this passage we're going to look at in Galatians, Paul is trying to make a point that he's been trying to make to the church in Galatia for the, first, for the, for the last three chapters of this book, okay? So he keeps coming back really to the same thing, and he's making an argument from different angles, different approaches to this argument, but he keeps trying to say this to them. We're not saved by ourselves. We're not saved by our own effort. We're saved by God's grace, which we receive through faith in Christ, what he's done for us on the cross. That's the gospel. That's the big idea of this whole series is that, that the gospel, the good news of Christ, that he paid the price for us, that we're, that we're unable to save ourselves, and that Christ came and died on the cross and rose to life again. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, we receive God's grace and we're made right in God's sight. That that good news, that gospel, that you can't, that's not a starting point. It's not just a starting point that then you move beyond. You can never move beyond the gospel. You only go further into it. You only understand Understand it more deeply and bring it into more parts of your life. That's the main point of the series. That's what Paul has been trying to just hammer into the Galatians through this whole letter. And so here we are um, at the end of chapter 4, and he's still making that argument. And this time he's making it from a new angle. He's, uh, the passage we're looking at, looking at today um, that he's using, he, he looks at uh, a story from the Old Testament, okay? And here's the question that it asks of us. The point, the angle that I think he's trying to come from. He's trying to ask, are you believing in God's promise or are you believing in yourself? We have this idea that just, just believing in yourself and figuring out a way to get things done is such a good thing. But if it leads us to not believe in God's promise, to try and do things our own way, to try and save ourselves instead of believing in what he's done for us, and there's destruction that comes from that. Paul describes it as slavery. So we can take this good thing and we can twist it. Believing in ourselves instead of believing in God's promise leads to slavery. That's where Paul is going to go. So we're going to try and work through this passage. Like I said, it's a little bit of a complicated one. Um, uh, and we'll do, our, we'll do our best, all right? So Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 21, is where we're going to be. And we'll go through the end of the chapter there through verse 31. So Paul starts off saying, uh, Galatians 4 verse 21, tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? So let's stop there for a minute. Um, Paul is specifically addressing those who want to be under the law, right? He says, tell me you who desire to be under the law. Um, he's, not, he's not saying, oh, he's not talking to those who just want to obey the law, okay? And again, um, by the law, he's referring to God's commands in the Old Testament, the Jewish uh, the Jewish law that was given to the people of Israel on Mount Sinai when Moses went up. On, he, he's, he's referring specifically to that. Those who want to live under the law. He doesn't, he's not just saying, um, hey, to those of you who want to obey the law. Because Paul has been saying that living under the law is a, is a bad thing. He doesn't mean that obeying the law is a bad thing. Um, God calls us to obedience. 
this phrase, under the law, means a very specific thing. Paul uses it in, in various writings through, throughout the New Testament. He's referring to those who want to live, who, who believe that living according to the law is your means of justification. It's how you're made right with God. That following the rules well enough will please God enough that he will say, you're righteous in my sight. That's living under the law. And Paul is saying, no, that's not how it works. That's what he's been saying all along. That's what he's saying here again. That's not how it works. And so he says, those of you who want to live like that, those of you who want to say the way that, I'll, that, that God and I will be cool is if I follow the law well enough, those of you who want to live like that, do you even really know what the law says? Because that term, the law, can mean that code of laws that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, given to the people of Israel, but it can also refer to the whole Old Testament, the law, the books of the law. And so, um, so he says to, says to them, okay, you want to live under the law, do you even really know, uh, do you really know what the law says? So that's who he's addressing, the people in, in, the, in Galatia who are, who are wanting to live under the law. Verse 22, he says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Okay. This story that he references here might be totally unfamiliar to you. Or you might feel like you have a grasp on it. Paul is assuming that the people who are reading this, this letter in Galatia, know the story he's talking about. So he takes two verses and summarizes the story, his point of the story. Um, we're going to, um, uh, we're just going to walk through a little bit more of that story. I'll just kind of cover the high points of that story so you can kind of catch up with the Galatians and be where they are. He just says, Abraham had two sons. He's, he's saying this is what's in the law. This is a story that's there. Abraham had two sons, slave woman, free woman, one son born according to the flesh, um, one son born through promise. Here's what he's referring to. Abraham and Sarah. So Abraham considered uh, the, the father, the great patri patriarch of the Jewish nation, right? Of the, Isra of the um, nation of Israel. And uh, 1,800 years before, um, before Paul, something like that, um, Abraham is called out of the place where he's living by God, and God says, come to the place where I'm going to show you. And God promises to him and to his wife, Sarah, oh, by the way, at the time they're called Abram and Sarai. God later changes their names to Abraham and Sarah. We'll just call them Abraham and Sarah for now. Um, but he says some things to Abraham, like, Abraham, you're going to be, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others, right? Um, he sh takes him to this land and shows him this land and says, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. He makes this promise to him. That's why they called it the promised land. I'm going to give this uh, land to your offspring. At the time, Abraham and Sarah don't have any offspring. They don't have any kids. And so then time passes, and Abraham says to God, look, I'm old. Uh, I don't have any kids yet. You've made these promises about what's going to be, belong to my offspring. What's, what's happening there? Right now, I don't have any kids, so one, somebody from my household, uh, one of my servants is going to be my heir, and they'll get what I have, and I don't, I don't have a son. And so God says to him, uh, you know, come out. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a son. Your own son will be your heir, not, not somebody else. Your own son will be your heir. He takes him out. He says, look up at the sky and see all the stars up there. If you count them all, that's what the number of your offspring will be like. So you're going to have all these descendants, more than you could count. Um, and he makes these promises to him. And he says, the whole world will be blessed through your offspring. And then more time passes, and uh, Abraham and Sarah get older. Now Abraham is 85, Sarah's 75. And Sarah comes to Abraham and says, look, God isn't letting me have children. It's just, it's not happening. He's, he's, uh, he's kept me from having children. And so here's what you should do. You should take my servant, Hagar, and you should get her pregnant. And maybe she'll have children, and those children will be our children. And we can kind of fulfill God's promises on our own, our own way. They, they basically say, wait, we've got an idea. Um, instead of believing in God's promise, let's believe in ourselves. And let's figure out our own way to do it, right? So God has given them this promise and something good is to come. And they say, well, let's do it our own way. Let's do it on our own. And they twist that. And of course, destruction comes from that because they're believing in themselves, not believing in God's promise. And so that's what happens. They take, uh, Abraham takes Hagar as, his, as, his, as another wife. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And, um, 
as you can imagine, this whole thing goes horribly wrong. I mean, it's just, it's, an, it's, it's a train wreck. And uh, sometimes people say about the Old Testament, well, I have a hard time believing the Old Testament, understanding God in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is just so backwards and so crazy, and like, it, it condones polygamy and slavery and all these things. And you look at something like this, and, and um, you look throughout the Old Testament, and you'll see that polygamy happens. There are people who take multiple wives in there, but God never condones it, and it's always just a nightmare for the people involved. I mean, this is just par for the course. It's just what you would expect. Um, Hagar gets pregnant. She starts to um, like feel like, oh, I, I, I can do something that, that Sarah, the old woman, couldn't do. And so she starts to, there's this tension between them, this jealousy, and Hagar starts to fear for her life. So she flees out of there, and God appears to her and says, no, I'm going to take, take care of you. You'll be okay. Go back. And, and have this child. And she, so she goes back into the camp and um, returns to Abraham and his family. And she has a son named Ishmael. And that's the son spoken of there that Paul talks about in this, in this passage. So she has this son named Ishmael, and there's terrible jealousy between Sarah and Hagar. Um, Thirteen years later, uh, God says to Sarah and Abraham again, he reminds them, no, you're going to have, you guys are going to have your own son. Ishmael is not the son of the promise. Um, Sarah, you're going to have, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a son. And she laughs and it just seems too crazy. But a, 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 sure enough, a year later, she's pregnant um, and she gives birth to a son, Isaac. Okay, so that's the other son that Paul references here, Isaac. And then there's more conflict. Uh, and, and in the end, they decide we've got to get rid of Hagar and her son. They can't live with us anymore. And so they send them off into the desert. And they almost die of thirst out in the desert. But God takes care of them and provides water for them. And, uh, and they survive. And Ishmael lives. And the Bible talks about his descendants. And, um, and because God has cared for them. So it's this crazy story. That's what Paul's referring to when he says um, Abraham had two sons. He's talking about Isaac and Ishmael. When he says one by a slave woman, one by a free woman, Hagar and Sarah. Um, the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. So the son of the slave, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh, according to their own plan, according to human effort. Uh, while the son of the free woman, Isaac, born of Sarah, was born through promise. That was where God had to step in and do something miraculous, something incredible, something that these people couldn't do on their own. And so Paul is setting up these two things. Um, you'll, uh, you'll notice, just one thing I got to mention, you'll notice that God's treatment of, of the marginalized people in this story. There's, um, there's, there's, both of these women are in situations where they would really be looked down upon in their culture. One because she was a servant and one because she, um, she couldn't have any children. And in both of those situations, God does something. He takes, uh, he takes them and he changes their situation. He cares for this servant woman when she's cast out into the desert. And he cares for this woman, Sarah, by providing uh, a son for her. God, we just see that character in him. He cares about the marginalized. Okay, so um, verse 24, Paul says this. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Okay. Paul says this may be interpreted allegorically. So he says that we can, we can, we can take this as an allegory. Okay, so little definition of allegory. A story which is a picture of a deeper meaning or truth story which is a picture of a deeper meaning or truth. So Paul says we can look at it that way. Allegory, think of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. That's an allegory. Um, that's the way C.S. Lewis wrote it. So you have this story of Aslan and all the different elements of that, but if you just look at Aslan the lion in that story, that's one of those things where, um, he, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the lion who is, who rules over everything, he created everything, um, and he's put to death to save somebody else. I can't remember the kids in that. Peter, Edmund, I don't know. Um, to save one of them. And then, uh, and then he comes back to life. You know, so it's this allegory. It's this picture. Uh, it's a story, but it's a picture of a deeper meaning or truth that C.S. Lewis was trying to communicate. Okay. So Paul says, let's look at this passage allegorically. He says, he says we, you may, we may look at it allegorically. He, he doesn't say you have to. It may be interpreted allegorically. 
So Paul does something that we normally wouldn't do and probably normally shouldn't do probably with, it shouldn't be the normal way we approach scripture, story in the Old Testament. You don't come to it and just go, this kind of reminds me of another story, um, if that wasn't the intention of that story in the Old Testament. So Paul isn't saying this Old Testament story um, isn't a true story. It's just an allegory for this. He's not saying that. Um, he's not saying that when this happened, this is all it was really about. When this happened, it was, it was just about this. I mean, that story is something that happened, and it happened for a purpose, and God used that real event in history for a purpose. But Paul is saying, in addition to that, in addition to what it, that this event meant originally, let's also look at it as an allegory. Let's take it as an illustration. We can see something else about how God works by looking at this story. So that's what he's going to do. We're going to look at it allegorically. And he lines up, he takes this story as an allegory and says, let's look at what the different things, the different elements of this story, as a picture, represent a deeper truth. Um, and what Paul does, the reason, part of the reason this passage is tricky is he's taking a story that was probably familiar to these people, maybe more familiar than it is to us, and uh, he's taking it, and he's, he's letting them think that it, it means that it has one kind of implication, and he's flipping on its head. Um, he's, he's taking a story that they might have known because maybe it's a story people were already talking about in Galatia. This, this argument that's going on that we've been talking about. Do you live by the—is Jesus enough, or do you need to live by the law as well? Is— what Christ did for us, there, there's people saying Christ did for us is good and it's essential, but an, the other essential on top of that is to follow the law if you really want to be right with God, to obey all the rules of the law. If you, do, if you do both of those things, if you have Jesus and you follow the law, then you're okay. That's one the other camp. The other camp is saying, no, Jesus is enough. Just Jesus. That's, that's what you need um, to be right with God. You need him. You need what he's done. And in that argument— if people looked at this story, we don't know for sure that they did, but some people say maybe that's why Paul brings this story up. They looked at this, this story, they might look at it like this. There are, in the, in, the, in the early church, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. And both now can say, we are sons of Abraham. We are sons of God. That's what Paul's been saying, that we can all say that, Jew or Gentile, we can all say that we are now sons of God, sons of Abraham, because of what Christ has done. But this story could be used, this story of Hagar and Sarah, of Ishmael and Isaac, to say, yes, Abraham had two sons, but really, one was the legitimate son, Isaac, and one was the illegitimate son, Ishmael. And the Jews are descended from Isaac, the legitimate son. So even though we all may be in the same camp, in the same church, in the same body of believers, because we're all followers of Christ, the Jews who are following the Jewish law have a leg up because they're descended from Isaac, the true son. And the Gentiles are more like those descended from Ishmael, the illegitimate son. So really being Jewish and a Christian is better. And so Paul is going to squash that argument by taking this story that may have been used that way and then flipping it on its head. And so he says, two women, two sons, let's take it allegorically. Um, he says this, these, verse 24, um, these women are two covenants. Two covenants. Two different ways of relating to God. Um, one is from Mount Sinai. The place, Mount Sinai is the place where the law was given, right? That's where God uh, spoke to the Israelites, gave Moses the law. So that's where one of these covenants originates there at Mount Sinai. That's where it's home. That's where, that's where it's from. And that's where the law came from. So one covenant is about the law. And it's, for, it's from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. This is what Paul's been saying all along. If, if, you're, just tr if you're trying to follow the law, and, and use that to make you right with God, you'll never be able to do it. They couldn't do it. You and I can't do it. We can never live so rightly, so perfectly, follow God's rules well enough that we'll be good enough, that we'll live up to his standards. We'll never live up to his standards. So to try and live that way, to try and say, I gotta do better, I gotta do better, I gotta do better, 
is slavery. So he says, one covenant is from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, bearing children for slavery. Um, trying to justify yourself, rather than trying to, to trust God's justifying grace, is slavery. So he says, she is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So in this story, Hagar represents this old covenant. Now, one thing I got to say about that, it will sound like Paul, in this, Paul is saying, Hagar is good, uh, uh, sorry, Hagar is bad, Sarah is good. If you read the original story, that's not the way it plays out. Paul is simplifying things, he's looking at it allegorically, okay? So he's saying they represent these two covenants. One covenant is the covenant we're living in now, one is the old way. But he's not saying Hagar is bad, Sarah is good. If you look at this mess that was started back in Genesis, in the original story, was Sarah's idea to believe in, in, in themselves, to go their own way instead of going the way of God's promise. So, so it's just important to, um, to recognize again that Paul is making an argument not about really about Sarah and Hagar, but about what they represent uh, in, in, in this way of looking at it. So he says, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. This is just another shot at the, at the Judaizers in this church because Mount Sinai, he's saying, is in Arabia. Uh, Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. And so they're just, he's just, he's just saying Mount Sinai, where you got the law, is actually in Arabia. Um, it's actually where Ishmael's descendants lived. So he's just making a connection between that Mount Sinai, the old way of thinking, and Ishmael. So, um, and then he says, uh, Hagar's in Mount Sinai in Arabia. Uh, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. So Jerusalem, the place where the law is, is um, practiced most and best, the center of Judaism, he says that's slavery. It's, it's following the law. In Jerusalem, Jerusalem isn't actually um, the high point of following God. It's actually a place of slavery right now. Um, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. So Paul is just, this is where it starts to get confusing. Because he says, let's look at this story allegorically. Two women, okay? Let's compare the two women. Two covenants, okay? Let's compare the two covenants. Two sons, okay? Two covenants, two sons, two women. Let's compare that. Um, then he throws in a mountain, Mount Sinai. And then he throws in a city, Jerusalem. And then he throws in uh, an, another city, a Jerusalem that's above, this heavenly Jerusalem. And then he quotes the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 1 is what he quotes here when he says, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not, break, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So he just, he, he brings in another element now. He brings in this Old Testament prophecy about the restoration of Jerusalem. Um, it was written at a time that the people of Jerusalem were scattered and Jerusalem was empty this, because, because the people were in exile in Babylon and, and he was prophesying that one day Jerusalem would be restored. And so Paul is saying the current Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that's out there where everybody's following the law, they're in slavery right now, but you guys are part of a new Jerusalem, a heavenly Jerusalem, a new city of God's people who live not by the law, but who live under God's grace what God has done for them, who believe in God's promise. They don't just believe in their, themselves and the ability to keep the law. So it's complicated, but Paul pulls in all these different elements. And then he finishes by saying, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Thankfully, he kind of comes back and summarizes a little bit for us, okay? He, he makes these complicated, confusing comparisons, and he says, you brothers, uh, like Isaac, are children of promise. You ended up where you are, not because of your own strength, your own power, your believing in yourself, but because of God's promise through Christ, God fulfilling his promise to reconcile the world to himself. That's how you got to where you are. Verse 29, but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. You're being persecuted by the people who want to live under the law. Verse 30, uh, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Get rid of that old way of thinking. Get rid of that way of thinking that we need to just follow the law and live in, in, in God's grace. And then he finishes by saying, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. 
Okay, so Paul lays out this argument. Let's just, I got a chart up here for you um, of all these different these different part, these different elements of this thing that he lays out. Every commentary I looked at in prepping for this passage at some point just has to write it all down in a chart like this because it's kind of confusing. And I don't know if this is helpful for you, but you can at least see, okay, he's just taking two pieces to this story and he's saying one is all about the law. Um, Ishmael, born because people took things into their own hands. That leads to slavery, trying to do things on your own. Hagar was the slave, uh, slave woman in the story. Um, that it's about living according to the flesh, about trying to, on your, trying to live according to your own power. That the law represents that old covenant. Earthly Jerusalem, um, where people are trying to live according to the law at that time. That's the old covenant. But there's a new covenant, and it's we can, that's represented by Sarah and Isaac in this story. They were unable to have children. There was nothing they could do about it. They couldn't, they couldn't work hard enough. They couldn't, they couldn't do anything about it. But God did it. He provided a son for them. That's the way the new covenant works. Um, it represents freedom because we're no longer slaves to try and do, 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 do to prove ourselves to God. Um, it comes about through a promise and through God fulfilling his promise providing a sacrifice for us, Christ on the cross. That's the gospel, not the law. And that it's represented by this idea of Jerusalem above, a new people, a new city of God, people who will get to live with God for all eternity. That's the, those are the sort of the two sides of that story um, that, that Paul pulls out. When he does that, like I said, he's trying to be, he's trying to be shocking. He's trying to, He's trying to say, look, you thought that you knew how it, was all, that how it all plays out, but it's not the way it works. Um, Ishmael and those in slavery are not the people who are following the law. I mean, sorry, are not the, are not the Gentiles. They're actually the people who are trying to follow the law. Um, and so he kind of, he takes that whole story and he flips it upside down and tries to disorient them, shock them a little bit. We may not get how shocking that is, um, uh, here's one way to think about what Paul is doing. Uh, I, heard, I heard a pastor at uh, Hope Community Church in Minneapolis. Um, great church. A lot of our college students at the U of M uh, go to church there. And he, he was talking about this passage, and he said, think about it this way. Um, what if instead of those two lists, um, what if they were— because we don't have that history of Jerusalem and the law. That's not, that's not part of our culture the same way. Um, but we do have like a, a, an NFL Vikings culture here, okay? I don't know how many of you are diehard Vikings fans, but I know some of you are, okay? Um, imagine this. Imagine if I came in and I said, um, I said, you know what? You've had it wrong all along. The true path to NFL greatness lies not in, in your memory of the great ones of the past, of Fran Tarkington, of Adrian Peterson in the present, but rather Vince Lombardi and Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that would be shocking, you know? Don't, don't clothe yourself. Clothe yourselves no longer in purple, but dress yourselves in green and gold. Put your hope not in the dome or the hole where the dome used to be, but in the hallowed grounds of Lambeau, you know? That's where victory lies. That's the path to true NFL greatness. It, if I said that, that would be offensive and shocking. I'm not saying that, because I, <laughs> I know the true path to NFL grace, greatness is at Soldier Field in Chicago. Okay? <laughs> but that's, that's what they're experiencing, okay? He's telling them a story that they think they know, and then he's saying, you've had it all wrong all along. It's completely backwards. We need sometimes to be woken up and shocked a little bit that way and go, wait a second, because we may not have the same history of looking at Jerusalem um, and looking at the law, but we do have a sense of individualism, of if I can get myself right, if I can just work harder, you even come to church and you hear somebody preach or you, you, you read scripture and you see something and you go, I got to work harder at that. There's some good in that, but when we take it and twist it and say, me being good at that, me working hard at that, me figuring this out is what will make me right with God, we need to have that broken in us. That's why Paul keeps making this argument over and over again. 
That's why we've kept coming back to this through this series in Galatians. We need to be reminded of that over and over and over again. That if it's about believing in myself and what I can do, that will always lead to slavery. Instead, I want to believe in what God has done, to believe in his promise and trust what Christ has done on the cross and live in that kind of freedom. And when I live in the freedom that comes from that, to know that I'm believing in God's promise, not in myself, then I can live and trust in him. Then I can be obedient to him, not by my power, but by his. Not motivated out of a sense of proving myself, but out of a sense of love, loving response to God. I want to be more obedient to God because I love you and you've done so much for me and you've made me right. Even though there's nothing I can do to make myself right with you, I want to learn to obey you more and more. We can live that way. Now, one last thing on this. There's this verse in here that we, we kind of skimmed over a little bit that I just want to come back to um, for one second, where Paul talks about being persecuted. Verse 29 where he says, he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. It's this one little part in the story in Genesis um, where, where Ishmael is laughing at Isaac. And he says, it's the same way now. It's also that way now. That those who are living according to the law, living under the law, persecute those who live uh, according to the flesh. And now sometimes that, uh, sorry, those who live according to the promise. But sometimes that happens um, blatantly. In Galatia, it probably was. They were saying, don't live like that anymore. Stop living like that. You've got to follow the law to really be right. So it's sort of open persecution in a sense. But sometimes it happens more subtly this way. Even if I say I need to live in the freedom that comes with knowing I'm accepted by Christ as I am, but I want to kind of hide that. I want to hide my mistakes and my errors and I want to put my best, I want to kind of put my Instagram and Facebook best face out there, you know, and show people my best side all the time, show them what's good and not let them see what's broken and what needs repair in my life. If I do that, in a sense, I'm, I'm not only living in slavery myself, in a sense, I'm persecuting people around me because I'm not allowing them to see what it's like to live in freedom. I'm saying I'm free in Christ but I'm still living in slavery. I'm still feeling like I've got to put my best foot forward all the time and just show what's good. Um, if, you've seen, uh, if you've seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, um, there's this thing that happens in there where you have somebody who gets out of prison. He's set free, but he doesn't know how to live free. And so it's actually, he, he just doesn't know how to live that way. He, he has no picture of it. And so he gets out of prison and he's, He's free, but he doesn't know how to live free, and so he ends up taking his own life. It's the middle of the movie. Then towards the end of the movie, another guy gets out of prison, and it looks like he's headed down the same path. He's been set free. He's out of prison, but he doesn't know what it looks like to live free until Andy Dufresne gets him to come out to Mexico, to, to the beach with him. And the movie ends there, but you get this idea that he now has a picture of someone else who's living in their freedom. He's living free, and now that he sees that, he has some hope that he can live free as well. I think when we, when we continue to try and justify ourselves, we not only do damage to ourselves, living in slavery ourselves, but we do damage to the people around us because instead of giving them a picture of what it looks like to live free, we give them a picture of what it looks like to still live in slavery. So how might that look in our lives? Just one, one way that I thought of that is, um, is when we're with other believers— when, when you're in a small group, okay, or when you're just in a conversation with somebody, and you have the opportunity to talk, not every conversation goes this way, when you have an opportunity to talk honestly about what's going on in your life, to make opportunities to have those kind of, kind of conversations with other believers is important. So you make time for that. It's part of your small group. It's part of your, um, your, your relationships in other ways. When you're in those situations, what if we truly lived out our freedom in Christ and in those situations, we're honest about our shortcomings, honest about our struggle, because the only way we can do that is if we believe in God's promise instead of believing in ourselves. I can be vulnerable about my mistakes, about my brokenness, about the parts of my life that are wrong, and my desire to live differently, to live rightly. I can be honest about that with you but only if I'm believing God's promise. 
that your, uh, your condemnation of me or anyone else's condemnation of me does not mean that I'm condemned. That in Christ I'm free, that I'm not, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know? So really believing in God's promise and what he's done for us, really believing the gospel, really believing that Christ has paid the price for me, allows me to live with an openness that does not, does not show arrogance. Hey, look, yeah, hey, I got, I got, uh, you know, I got mistakes in my past. I got mistakes in my present. Uh, who cares about that? It's not that, but it's saying, look, these are the things I'm struggling with, and I know that God is with me in spite of all of this, and because of all of this, he's working on me and in me through all of this. You know, when we live with that kind of openness to the people around us, we can give them a picture of what it looks like to live free. I hope that you want to do that. I hope that you want to live that way for, for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to give them a picture of freedom and how we can live that way in Christ. Let's ask God to help us in that, to remind us of what he's done for us. As we celebrate communion in just a moment, that will be a chance for you to do that, to be reminded that we're saved through God's promise, through his action, through Christ on the cross, not through our own work. And as you're reminded of that, feel the freedom to be honest, to be transparent, and to, to, to model that kind of freedom to the world around you. Let's pray.